Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. Hello there. Hello there. How are you today? Well, let me ponder that. Hang on. Okay. I'm good. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Glad to hear. I am also good. <laughs> Better even now that I have a lemon drop that you made for me. It's sort of a riff on a lemon drop. Mm-hmm. It's got fresh lemon and it's got lemon vodka, but it also has bergamot syrup instead of mm. simple syrup. Mm-hmm. And I didn't add any bitters or anything, so it's just a little bit of a riff. It's yummy. But I'm, I'm a little um, loath to call it a lemon drop. Okay. I think it should be called pulled pork. Pulled or, pork. <laughs> or, or crab cake. Or yeti. Ah, I see where you're going here. Where am I going here? <laughs> well, today we are talking about, or perhaps I should say, we are posing the question, what is an abomination? That's a word that gets thrown around pretty freely. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and when you start to really study what an abomination is in all kinds of contexts... Uh, it actually isn't what we usually say it is. Exactly. Certainly when I think of abominations, I think of the abominable snowman from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, who I think is amazing. He's so cute. He's kind of adorable. He really is. And yetis, not the insulated cups that everybody has, but the actual mythical Bigfoot creature. And if you don't think that the yeti is mythical, we apologize for having slammed your, your friend. Yeah, sorry about that. Also, abominations are things that Jews were forbidden from doing, Mm -hmm. but not for the reasons you might think. Because it's me, I looked up the word abomination in what I consider to be the best translation around, and that's Mm -hmm. the New Revised Standard Version, which has now been revised again. I saw that recently. Which is fine. Anyway, but the reason I like it is it, it leans toward literal as in word for word, as literal as possible, but it backs up a little bit from that so it makes sense, Ah, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. Because the ones that are actually word for word translations are almost impossible to interpret. Yeah. Any translation, if I am translating French into English, I'm not going to go word for word because it doesn't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So I like the New Revised Standard Version. So I looked it up. And I looked up abomination, which, by the way, is a Latin word. It actually comes out of the Latin. Really? Yes. Anyway, so I looked it up, and there are a hundred-ish places in the Bible that we currently translate as abomination. Four of them, four or six of them are in the New Testament. The rest of them are in the in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay. Now, most of those, I'm not going to say that, a good number of those are not actually in Torah, they come later. So, okay. so for those of you who don't know the distinctions among the Hebrew scriptures, Torah is the first five books of the Bible. It's the five that really set up who the Jews are. In other words, who they are as people of Yahweh. So it includes the origin stories. It includes all of that kind of early history, if you will. Gotcha. But the Torah is really it really frames what it means to be Jewish in a particular way. Mm. The question then comes to me, do we actually care about the word abomination? Like, I could go on and do word studies about this all day long and talk about how it's used, which of course I will do, but (laughs) is that why the question gets asked? Hmm, that is a fine question you pose. Hmm. I think we use it so casually Hmm. that really the meaning of it is almost irrelevant because people understand it to mean something. Yes. And when it's used in just conversation and you say, well, that's an abomination. Mm. Do, do you do that? I, it's a word I like, often. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I label okay. things abominable all the time. <laughs> okay, look, I was distracted when I made dinner the other night. Okay, so just stop. <laughs> No, actually, I don't use that word very often at all. People don't use it much. No. When it does come up, when I've heard it come up, it's usually kind of like joking, like 
to extreme, like super, the way people use superlatives. Oh, like, okay. this is the worst day ever. Okay. You know, this is an abomination, meaning like, you know, this casserole is an abomination. <laughs> okay, or stop this it outfit, already. <laughs> this outfit is an abomination. Okay. You know, and, okay. and so that's generally the way that I hear it. Okay. Hear you. So it's, it's just used to like extreme. Over the top. Way over the top, thank you, okay. yes. Okay. But that's not the reason any of our listeners would ask us to talk about No, and one of our listeners actually did. Okay. Lisa from Nashville asked us yeah. to clarify what is an abomination, and that's what we're doing. And do you think she did it because she had a cake that was an abomination? <laughs> the... I hope not. Okay. So let's back up for most of our listeners. Why does it matter? Why would our friend Lisa ask about this? I think that perhaps she would ask this because sometimes... Queer people are labeled abominations. Ah, yes. Mm. Yeah, there's one reference that I could find in the Hebrew scriptures to abomination used about anything that we might consider LGBTQ. Actually, leave off the Q for a minute because it has a kind of a different meaning, right? And that's, that's one in Leviticus where the phrase is Do not lie with a man as you would with a woman. This is an abomination. Mm -hmm. The challenge with this word is that people who fling it about in those ways only focus on that one place it's used and not on any of the others, which include pork, crab, other shellfish, Mm -hmm. swarming things, haughtiness, So one of the passages uh, that talks about abominations is actually in Proverbs. Uh, The New Revised Standard Version says this, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that hurry to run to evil, a lying witness who testifies falsely, and one who sows discord in a family. And they're all about behaviors towards other people. They're all about that. Wow, that's interesting. So, I lift this all up to say, even if you take the line in Leviticus as religiously important, if you're going to do that because of the word abomination, you got a whole bunch of other abominations you got to deal with. Right. So... You know, we did an episode a couple of years ago called What Are We Talking About When We're Talking About Sexuality? Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about always is other people's sexuality. Yes. Right? So when that word is used for sexuality, it is, I think, trying to reflect scripturally, but what it's really doing is using it the way that you were using it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's saying... This is the worst thing I can imagine, Mm -hmm. and it's the only five-syllable word I know. (laughs) Right. Right? So, I think that's, that's the issue. And whenever we are feeling bludgeoned by words, it is helpful to distinguish the ways that they are used in other contexts to know whether they're being used purely as weapons or whether, and in fact, They're being used in line with other things that are being used that way. Ah, okay. Okay? So if you go back to Leviticus, you're reading the Mosaic Law, Mm -hmm. which is um, the law that Moses brought Mm -hmm. down Mm -hmm. and that, frankly, rabbis interpreted since then. If you're interpreting the Mosaic Law and you're looking at the things that are about purity and the things that are about uh, ritual, Mm -hmm. um, that's not a good distinction, but we'll go with that one. Then if you're going to find that word... You're going to have to interpret it consistently as being taboo. Okay. And taboo, for most of us, does not mean horrible, you know, awful, awful. If I say that something's taboo, what I mean is I'm not supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. As opposed to I am condemned forever. Yeah. So that is the thing about these words that are used so casually to destroy other people is they are almost always used selectively as well. Right. I understand the word is from the Latin, the word abomination is mm-hmm. from the Latin, but clearly there was a word in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. What was the real meaning of that Hebrew word? There are actually four of them that get translated, and they're all related, get translated as abomination. 
It's hard to tell exactly what they meant, but roughly what they meant was don't do this. Okay. Okay. And a lot of the don't do this is were about helping the people of Israel distinguish themselves from the people surrounding them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was reading one Jewish commentary that was trying to figure out whether something is abominable or something's an abomination because it is taboo or if it's taboo because it's an abomination. Ah, okay. You see the difference, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I say to you, this table is an abomination, the question is, is it a bad thing because it's an abomination, or do I think of it as a bad thing, and so I'm calling it an abomination? Yeah. Right? Right. And, and that's not always clear in any of the words that are translated as abomination in the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay. Well, I've, I've understood abomination to mean simply not natural. That is one of the ways it is um, used from the Latin particularly, simply not natural. Gotcha. And then determining what is quote-unquote natural... A whole different problem. Creates the problem, right? Yeah. So if we take something like um, bisexuality, which has been called an abomination, Mm -hmm. right? The more and more researchers pay attention to creatures of all kinds, from little bugs to elephants, the more they discover that bisexuality actually permeates... The, the larger sense of the animal kingdom. Right. And they're now saying that it may be an evolutionary advantage because you're bonding with the people who are most like you and yet continuing the species, right? Yeah. So what they're seeing is that it's not that animal X is under duress and there's no other choice than having sex with the same sex as animal X is, Mm -hmm. okay, which is the way people used to think about it. They used to think, well, this happens because there are no other choices. Ah, yeah. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's not about that because they've been looking at animals that are in great shape, well-fed, plenty of room, doing all the things they're supposed Mm -hmm. to be doing, and they're just seeing it everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. So is it unnatural? Well, it would seem to be natural. Right. Okay. Well, then if it's not about natural, what's it about? Yeah. Would it then be more about what is against norms? Well... Of course, then again, it's who's establishing the norms. Exactly. And in fact, in the Mosaic Law, it's very clear that the norms included these things that were taboo. Mm -hmm. And what Moses and God were doing was to set up a different set of norms for these people to distinguish them from what was actually normative. Yes. So... (laughs) Right? Right. And so that's the issue. I'm not here to reclaim the word abomination and to say, no, it's meaningless in Scripture. It's absolutely meaningful in Scripture. And it's used a lot more than we use it for, Mm -hmm. including things like haughtiness, not taking care of the poor, that sort of thing. Right. Which no one, no one who would call one of us an abomination would be saying it because of those things. Right, no one would be. No. It might be because the way I dress, but that's a whole different issue. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm willing to say that this is an abomination. (laughs) For those of you who can't see me, I'm, I'm dressed kind of slovenly right now. So how then should someone respond if, if they are referred to as an abomination? I mean, how do, you, how do you answer that? Why would you answer it? Yeah, I guess that's a good point. I mean, honestly, if, if someone actually makes the effort to call you a word that they clearly don't understand mm-hmm. in order to hurt you, why would you be in relationship with them by responding to them? Right. You're engaging them in relationship. Why? Yeah, that's a good point. Now, if you had to, if it were, say, your brother whom you adore who has suddenly lost his mind because of long COVID and calls you this <laughs> word, right? and you want to clarify for him, you don't go for the word. You got to get off the word mm-hmm. because the word is so laden for the person who's using it that way that they can't actually talk about it. Yeah. 
You have to instead be more like, what, what brings you to say that? Why would you say that to me, someone whom you love? And where are you getting this idea about who I am exactly? That's a more relationship-building kind of conversation. Right. When, when people have beaten me up, either verbally or physically, I've walked away because I no longer, and it's been a while, I no longer let myself be beaten up by people. Why would I do that? Right, right. What do you guys think about abominations? Have you ever been confronted that way? Have you ever worried that perhaps you are an abomination? Have you wondered what the outcome of that means for you? Personally, I think, before this conversation and even more so now, I think that when we say things like, you're an abomination or you're doomed to hell or whatever, that it actually speaks much more to our own internal struggles Mm. and our own insecurities than it does the person that we're talking to or about. If you have been the victim of being called that, uh, what I would want to reassure you of is that you are not, in fact, doomed to hell for being outside somebody's norm. Norms are changing all the time. And it all depends on who you're talking to and who you're hanging around as to what the norms are. Mm -hmm. In my life, queer is very much a norm, along with a lot of other things that might be norms for you or not, (laughs) and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I I think that when we throw words around in our society today, you know, the rhetoric flies freely and it gets more and more inflammatory all the time. Mm -hmm. I think I would just caution all of us about using words like that. Yes. And if you, uh, you know, disagree with somebody's lifestyle or if you disagree with somebody's choices or you disagree with the way someone looks or the way they dress, maybe think twice before calling them an abomination or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't assume that even if, by some definition, you are an abomination, that God hates you and that you are <laughs> unlovable and ugly and irredeemable because that's just not true either. Well... And it, again, it is to be noted that in the Christian scriptures, it appears four times. Three of them are in Revelation, mm-hmm. which harkens back to, wait for it, the Hebrew scriptures in imagery. It does. Lisa, I hope that we uh, got close to answering your question. If you have other questions that you would like for us to discuss, please send them to us. You can email us at Elaine, E-L-A-N-E, or Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N, at schoolforseekers.com. We are always looking for things to talk about. Uh, We love cocktail ideas as well, Mm -hmm. so send those along. And as always, we welcome your comments and your questions about this or any episode. I think I need to go drink my Yeti. (laughs) I'm with you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye.